director of the Breast Oncology Center, and Thompson, senior uh, investigator of breast cancer research at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, professor in the Department of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, physician, Brigham, and Women's Hospital and the ASCO Board Director Member, USA. Thanks very much. All right. Well, my only disclosure is that I have to argue something I don't really believe, but here goes. I will still do my very best. As Dr. Partridge just showed you, tamoxifen is a very remarkable drug. But can't we do better? We've been using this drug for 40 years, and there's ample evidence that we can move beyond it. So we've known for decades that ovarian ablation is an effective treatment. These data come from the overview and compare ovarian ablation to no treatment, no chemotherapy, and demonstrated a remarkable benefit for ovarian ablation. And with that um, background, it's also worth noting that in studies such as NSABP B30, where they looked at women who experienced premature uh, menopause, cessation of ovarian function with chemotherapy, that in fact those who underwent menopause as a result of chemotherapy did far better in this study, both in terms of survival and disease for, for survival, than those who continued to have regular cycles. There have been multiple looks over the years at the addition of ovarian suppression or ovarian ablation to other therapies. This um, was part of a meta-analysis that was done a number of years ago. And while the curves do not separate, there were many, many confounders, including the fact that this was in general an older group of patients, and the majority of them received chemotherapy, which for many who didn't undergo ovarian ablation would have had the same functional effect. Now then we saw the results of the ABCSG trial several years ago. This trial compared ovarian suppression with tamoxifen versus ovarian suppression plus anastrozole. And the point I want to make here is that these women did phenomenally well. Whether they received tamoxifen or whether they received anastrozole, ovarian uh, ablation or ovarian suppression here was probably a very, very important treatment. Well over 90% of these patients were alive and disease-free five years later, and about a third of these patients actually had node-positive disease. So these are the designs of the text and soft trials, and I'll first briefly talk about text and then soft. So in text, not only is ovarian ablation important, but the addition or the use of an aromatase inhibitor is important. And across the board in text, exomestane is the winner. No, there isn't an improvement in overall survival yet. Um, but it's only a little more than five years out. Um, and at that point in time, one wouldn't expect to see an improvement in overall survival. And yet, there was a several percentage point advantage in terms of disease-free survival with the use of exomestane in place of tamoxifen. And that was seen in this forest plot in every single subgroup, some a little bit more dramatic than others, but there is no subgroup in which patients who received tamoxifen did better. And as you may remember from the report, the side effects associated with exomestane in this group of premenopausal women was, were not substantially uh, worse than those who received tamoxifen. Now let's move on to soft. Soft, of course, was presented just uh, a month ago in San Antonio and looked at tamoxifen versus tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression. And then there was an arm that also looked at exomestane plus ovarian suppression um, it, that will be referenced in some of these slides. And as Dr. Partridge said, overall, the study did not meet standard criteria for statistical significance. The p-value was 0.10, but the hazard ratio, nevertheless, was 0.83. And 0.10 is getting pretty close, particularly in a study 
that for a variety of reasons was a little messy and in my mind clearly suggests that there's a role here for ovarian function suppression. And there were secondary objectives looked at as well beyond um, uh, disease-free survival, breast cancer-free interval, um, and in each of these there was also a similar trend. More importantly, among the women who were at highest risk in this study, the women we worry about the most, these are women who were premenopausal and whose doctors had decided to give them chemotherapy. In that group of patients, there was a much more dramatic improvement in outcome associated with either ovarian function suppression with tamoxifen or even more so with exemestane. Um, and you can see the numbers on the slide, but the absolute improvement is quite substantial. And finally, most dramatically, in women under the age of 35, a very, very striking improvement um, for the use of ovarian function suppression, um, and most so when given with the aromatase inhibitor, exemestane. And finally, um, I'll just add um, that, of course, this is all consistent with what we have seen in postmenopausal women, um, where, in fact, the use of an aromatase inhibitor, in this case, um, an aromatase inhibitor after tamoxifen, but in multiple other studies, an aromatase inhibitor given up front, have, has clearly outperformed tamoxifen alone. So, at least in my view, tamoxifen is really a drug of the past. It's an old-fashioned drug. Um, it just doesn't deserve to have a place in any pharmacy shelf, apart from maybe the patient who can't tolerate an aromatase inhibitor. But even there, maybe you should just give up and not bother. So with that, I'll end. Um, but um, in fact, Anne is going to stand up and give you our joint view of how one should approach this. Okay, so now I'll tell you how we really feel. Um, you know, I think in our group, and we're getting calls from all over the country, and I suspect all of you are getting this kind of uh, tell us what we should be doing uh, calls. Basically, it's great. The results of soft and text are great because it allows us some flexibility and hopefully over time some improvement in the overall survival of uh, women, young women or premenopausal women with breast cancer. And so, in general, what we've decided as a group, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, is tamoxifen alone is the right choice still for women with lower risk disease. The folks that are no negative or minimal nodal involvement, older, no chemotherapy because you didn't want to give them chemotherapy because that's a marker of lower risk and perhaps lower risk by, or certainly lower risk by gene profile, other, all other things being equal. And yet now for those higher risk folks, we've got an alternative that is associated at least in the, those that get chemo and maintain their menses because they needed that in order to get into the study of soft, especially the less than 35 year olds, which are, make up a very small minority on average, but obviously they bear a lot of the burden we've got the option of ovarian suppression to be added to an AI or tamoxifen. And that's for the higher risk node positive, younger in general, although again, we still wanna make sure we're not over treating the young women. And if you wouldn't have given them chemotherapy, then maybe you shouldn't be suppressing their ovaries if they have a very low risk tumor. Cycling after chemo, of course, and of course, higher risk by gene profile. Again, that might drive us to give chemo, but perhaps if they're in an intermediate area with an intermediate, um, intermediate size or anatomy of tumor, that might push you to do a little bit more. Do you want to add? So some additional points here. Um, no trial so far uh, looking at ovarian function suppression has demonstrated a survival advantage, as we both pointed out. Many patients will fall into this gray category, so again, doctors will have to be doctors, and we're going to have to make patients, make individualized decisions with patients bearing what we know about the risks and what we know about the benefits. Toxicity is a major concern, particularly for some patients, and I always caution patients, if they say, oh, why don't I just get my ovaries out? 
I always caution them, let's just suppress you for a little while unless we need them out for a mutation, because I've had patients come in and say literally that they feel suicidal without having their ovaries in, and you can't put them back, and it's really uncomfortable to put uh, them back on hormonal therapy. Adherence is a critical issue, and I don't know what the last point is, but it's probably not so important, and I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Do you have... Thank you. We're done. Thank you, Professor Anne. And now, uh, this session is open for discussion. First, we are going to discuss in five minutes the first topic regarding new adjuvant systemic treatment in almost all patients with breast cancer. Please, but Professor... Uh, Matthew Apro and uh, Professor Conti would come to the stand, and uh, we can we, we start discussion for five minutes. Hmm? Hmm? Any questions? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who is pro or con? Did, Nobody wants to, to participate or to ask? Dr. Ale, please go. <laughs> you didn't? Okay. Okay. Who is pro and who is anti the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy for nearly all patients with breast cancer? You want to say something? Yes, yes go ahead. From an oncology uh, point of view, I'm with, and the idea is that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a treatment that you don't only apply for the patients to achieve complete pathological response, but you, you know the kind of sensitivity of the tumor you're talking about, rather than the adjuvant treatment, which is, in a way, a blind for, form of treatment. That's my opinion. And if the results tell us this, that neoadjuvant is as good as adjuvant treatment, for well, I think that an oncologist would prefer to do that before the surgery rather than do it after the surgery on microscopic disease. This is my point of view. For all stages and all patients, uh, well, Dr. Rada? This is arbitrary. That's the argument. I mean, at, yeah. least, at least for the locally advanced or the not positive disease, large tumors or the not positive disease, at least to start with. Please. Uh, thank you very much, both speakers. Great talk. Uh, in, in practical, uh, sense, I think most of our patients, I mean, in the uh, Saudi, we have only one third of our patients who have early breast cancer. So most of our patients would need neoadjuvant chemotherapy at least to make surgery, uh, you know, feasible and complete resection to be achieved. That's, that's one point. The other point, what we are doing now, the only patients who will go for straightforward surgery are the ones whom we are not contemplating the use of chemotherapy. So we do the Oncotype DX at that point, and we do the surgery up front, and we can avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. If you have a patient where the true cut biopsy telling you this is a luminal A disease and it's very early disease, then chemotherapy might not be, de might not be needed altogether. So these patients, yes, we are going ahead for straightaway surgery, but all the rest are getting the adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist, and every week we had a hot discussion with the surgeon regarding good responders to new adjuvant chemotherapy. And the issue is, should he conservatively operate on, su on such a breast who is looking at advanced disease, or do the radical, classic mastectomy? Now, new adjuvant chemotherapy is a good tool, but I do believe that it improves our probability, but it doesn't down the stage of the disease. I mean, if at the beginning, a T4 disease invading the skin, the classic surgical management should be mastectomy. Whatever this patient res responded completely to chemotherapy or not. So I do believe that new adjuvant chemotherapy, yes, is indicated and should be the treatment of the choice for, for local original advanced disease, but it shouldn't affect the surgical decision. So, 
I'd like actually to, you know, have more views on this because we, sorry, we, we face this problem with the surgeons all the time. They think they have to go with the initial disease signs for getting about downstaging. You start with seven centimeters and he says, look, this patient is for, for mastectomy from day one. And you give, let's say we are dealing with triple negative breast cancer. After two cycles, the tumor might disappear almost completely. And yet the patient will go for total mastectomy. Is it acceptable for ev everyone in the room here? Because we are not doing this. We are taking actually post-chemo evaluation unless we have a skin biopsy, not, you know, the surgeon's eyes, a skin biopsy to say this is inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, okay, please. I have to come back. Uh, yeah. For the sake of time, uh, yes. let uh, the experts uh, say uh, their opinion concerning this issue. One last moment. One moment, okay. <laughs> Again, being a radiation oncologist, when this patient had a conservative surgery, then she comes to me, and I have to use <laughs> the tumor bed. I'm almost radiating the whole post, which is not quite uh, logical. I mean, which tumor would you operate upon? The initial advanced one or the good responded one to chemo? Yeah. I think that we have two uh, questions uh, which are indeed important in the setting of uh, patients that have received neoadjuvant treatment, i.e., what is the uh, surgical position, what is the radiation oncology position. So I will just say what... Uh, uh, my surgical team does and what my radiation oncology team does. So uh, Piana Mrioski, in, mo in most cases, takes into account the fact that there has been a reduction, but we are in a very favorable situation. We very rarely see the massive tumors that you have, and I'm not aware of enough data, I'm not aware of enough data to tell us that the patient that had a massive invasion uh, in, of the skin and was down, uh, was, uh, had the downsizing of the tumor because there was some concern about what was happening behind this tumor is still a, a patient that you, where you would like to do a skin sparing mastectomy. Uh, I think that, that that's an issue that needs to be debated. As far as radiation therapy goes, both Jean-Claude Oriot and uh, Jacques Bernier estimate that the initial risk needs to take in, take, be taken into account because the local relapses do exist in these cases, and we have had that from history for the last years, where uh, surgery was not done, radiation was emitted, uh, and uh, th things uh, turned very, poor, very sadly for the patients. Uh, we have uh, discussed a lot today the theme of personalized cancer medicine. I think that neoadjuvant treatment is the best way to apply what we know today in order to achieve a more personalized cancer medicine because you can adapt, we can make the choice of a type of surgery on the basis of a response observed on the, on the individual patient and apart, of course, the cases where conservative surgery is contraindicated up front because of multicentricity of a tumor, for instance, or infiltration of the skin and so on. In all those cases, and these are the majority of the patients where you achieve an objective response, you can reduce the extent of surgery. You can uh, avoid axillary node dissection because we know that even in those cases who would be sentinel node positive up front, you have a 30 to 40% conversion to sentinel negativity after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so in at least one third of the patient you can spare an unnecessary axillary node dissection. So, so certainly it's a more personalized surgical approach to, to breast cancer patients. In terms of radiation, I think, uh, you know, uh, we... we we have guidelines in the local regional management of breast cancer which are based largely, if not exclusively, on the basis of classic adjuvant trials, which means patients are operated and then on the basis of a pathological extent of a disease we decide what to do in terms of local control and systemic treatment. So for this reason, essentially, still now we have to treat in terms of radiation therapy 
patients after neoadjuvant treatment as we would have treated those patients before neoadjuvant treatment. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And now we move to the next debatable session. Are you concerning the role of would chemotherapy have minimal role in the era of, pre of uh, precision uh, medicine. I would like to invite Professor Kammer. Okay, he is here. And now uh, the session is open for discussion. Please, the light. Turn the light on, please. Any questions? Would you please uh, turn the light on? And now, okay, go ahead, Dr. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, great talk. It's a, it's, it's a note for me. For the last 20 years, how many new chemotherapy agents we have seen. It, it's very striking that in the last 20 years, we have seen a lot of target therapy coming into the market but very few chemo has made it, you know, after taxes, what do we have, Europelin, you know, anything else? We, why is this? Why is there's no investment in the chemotherapy in the field of cancer treatment in the last 20 years? While we had a lot of investment with target therapy, we have seen, yes, very good outcomes, but as, as it has been pointed, it's not a great except in very few you know, cases where target therapy had made a big difference. Any explanation? I guess you'd have to ask the people who own the drug companies because <laughs> they're the ones who make the investment. But I think the reason is that they believe that further substantial gains, I'm not saying you wouldn't get minor gains, but further substantial gains by using a very broad-based cytotoxic are unlikely to be seen, whereas I guess the investors feel that by decoding the biology and coming up with a much more biologically targeted drug, they will deliver much more substantial clinical effects and therefore presumably better value for their investment. But it's really a decision made by the drug companies more than anybody else, in fact, I think. I'm, I'm agreed with that. And, I, you, you know, working in the drug development area, I've been seeing many times how uh, good drugs are killed by bad decisions and CEOs of the companies. And there is a, like a mood uh, that the, you know, all of the microtubular agents, inhibitors that we have from the taxons, ixabepilon, uh, ribulin recently, et cetera, et cetera, they try to do oral drugs and with less toxicity. So that is a, something is in the mood and most of the companies are aligned in this, in this type of production. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, people want to do something novel against one of a uh, new target, and I think this is a right choice and right direction. Yeah. Who is pro and who is contrary of this uh, debatable question? Would you please, can we crystallize our questions, please? And uh, Dr. Heba, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the debate. It's exciting. Actually, our dream, once upon a future to have no chemotherapy in the area of breast cancer. Me, as a clinician, I will be very happy to tell every woman, you may lose some part of your breast, but I assure you, you will not take chemotherapy. Because it's still, again, the fear of cancer is because of removal of breast as well as chemotherapy. And you know how much every woman will be frightened if she hear about chemotherapy and loss of her hair. Yes, this is our dream. But on the real life, I think by many biology we discover in the cancer cell, still we cannot target them biologically. So for me, yes, it is dream. But for real life, we will stick to chemotherapy and different types of chemotherapy for a long time. Because once we know HER2 overexpression, we know that the many biology under HER2 is uh, motiv motivation or making this mutation more and more. So we still have to join biology with chemotherapy. 
As regards Professor Dr. Ahmed Saad al-Din, why everybody go for biotherapy and the targeted therapy and not chemotherapy? For my own simple explanation, because chemotherapy alone reach a plateau in response and in adjuvant control and in metastatic setting, and we have to join it. So they invest for an expensive new target. Yeah, I think it's a, a you know the the role of chemotherapy nowadays in the uh, precision medicine is is we, we need to use we're still using you, we are seeing that the the a very small type of response that we obtain, um, but uh, I think in the future is not only precision medicine will change the chemotherapy yes or chemotherapy no precision medicine will provide information with a patient with a T2 pancreatic cancer, and we will have the biopsy, and we will, after we analyze this biopsy, we will know if this patient will need radiation or surgery, or this patient will need only systemic chemotherapy. And I say the pancreatic cancer because we are analyzing a project like this with a MUC uh, a receptor. Uh, but this, is a, this can apply at all type of cancer. So it's not only precision medicine will change the paradigm with or, or no chemotherapy will change how we see the tumors and how we treat these tumors. That is going to be the goal. Thanks a lot. But please don't stop admit, dreaming. Yeah. Who would have thought <laughs> that a drug invented as an oral contraceptive <laughs> called tamoxifen would cure more patients than probably any other drug in cancer? And when we first used Herceptin in the phase three trial, I did not believe what a huge difference it would make in the adjuvant setting. So yes, chemotherapy has a role now, but I think we are in danger of reaching a plateau. I don't know which the next brilliant targeted drug will be. There will be many that fall by the wayside, but please don't stop dreaming. It would be a wonderful world if I never had to give chemotherapy again. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And now we move to the very interesting, debatable issue of endocrine therapy in premenopausal women. Is tamoxifen still the standard of care, please. Uh, thank you so much for both uh, excellent, uh, outstanding speakers. So I have uh, questions. Uh, you made it, I think, uh, clear, uh, especially in the last slide. But my question regarding uh, patient who already, uh, they are high-risk patient, and they are receiving tamoxifen for the last, uh, for say, two years. So, and still the patient is uh, regaining her periods. Can I start uh, LHRH, giving, uh, like keeping in my mind that the patient uh, uh, risk will be still between two to three years and she might have risk also beyond five years. So your patient has relatively high risk, has been on tamoxifen for two years. Can you start ovarian suppression and an AI? So it depends on how much of a purist you are. Um, if you're an absolute purist, you continue that tamoxifen for five years and then you take the results of MA17 and you still extrapolate a little bit because I'm going to presume she's still premenopausal then, um, in, which, in which case the results of MA17 would not, be, would not directly apply. You could put her on tamoxifen for...